welcome to Forbidden Planet 42, celebrating 42 glorious years of Forbidden Planet and 42 years of trying to answer the ultimate question to life, the universe and everything. And I am joined by the immortal Chris Claremont. If there is one <laughs> comic book author, one comic book oh, writer, God. apart from Stan Lee, who has had complete influence over the pop culture world in which we live now. Uh, absolutely no hyperbole. It's this man right here. How are you doing, Chris? Oh, for goodness sakes. <laughs> I mean, I'm doing, I'm doing fine. I just, you know, I, you know, it's, what can I say after an intro like that? Yeah. Well, it's an intro that you deserve. And, mm. uh, and, and, and uh, I can say that, it, it, you know, uh, that's the beauty of having, being a, uh, a 30 year plus fan of yours I can say it you know maybe it was you saying it would be a bit rich but I can say it so before we talk about anything else thanks for all the immense pleasure that your work has given me and the Forbidden Planet faithful sincerely mate I, I've, I've got so many of your comic books I, I you know I couldn't tell you how many it was but it is a lot it is a well, vast in, amount in the classic cliche I'm not done yet as a matter of fact I just sent in a um just having a discussion with an editor about the last page of a story I turned in, uh, or I wanted to go one way and, and they wanted to go another, and we're, I, we'll just see how it turns out. With any luck, you'll find out later in the year. Well, fingers crossed. Well, when you do know, you must come back and, and speak to us. Oh, I, don't, I, no I, worries there. I'd no love to know more. So, I, so we'll get to New York and I'll have a panel. And, yes. Oh, no, that won't happen. Yeah. Well, not this year, but maybe next year. Who knows? By the end of next year, who knows? Yeah. I mean, that is, we could we could fill a whole hour talking about this entire situation. So well, rather than do that, that I, get, I want London to come back online so you guys can invite me there. Oh yeah, well you know you have an open invite as soon as you're allowed to fly here and as soon as you're allowed allowed to uh, accept. Assume, you know, assuming there American are any residents. airlines left in business. Uh, well, that's uh, you. You said you said it, mate. You said it, mate. Let me ask you a question. When did you first become aware of Forbidden Planet? Let's see. I don't know. In the very late 70s? Oh, yeah. Right at the beginning, in other words. Right oh, yeah. No, no, no. Because yeah, yeah. I, I usually try to hop over to London to see the family. Well, Eastbourne to see the family. And... and of oh, course, Chris, for people who don't know, Chris was born in, uh, Chris yes, was born I in England. A, I have a red passport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My whole lucky life. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, oh my God, we can, you know, free access to the EU. Thank heaven. <laughs> <sighs> yes, well, I feel you on that score. I really do. Yeah, well, no, it, it's, um, no, I've, yes, I am British, accent notwithstanding. Uh, born in Lo North West London and kidnapped, abducted by pirates when I was a wee lad, S taken across the pond and thrown into abject servitude. <laughs> in, and the rest in, is history. Yeah, well, In there Long you go. Island, you grew up in Long Island, right? We still live. Yes, yes. So you, you of course, are one of, um, one of a handful of people to have successfully destroyed Forbidden Planet on a number of well, occasions. At least three different three different stores and three different cities. And of course turned Lando, Luckman and Lake into an interdimensional group of fixers. Yeah. So so for, for those watching this who don't know, uh, Nick Lando is the uh, is the founder of Forbidden Planet and the co owner with Vivian Chung of Forbidden Planet. And he and his today, partners today forty years ago it was a totally years different. Ago, it was and and you turned the the original the original Forbidden Planet team into a trio of galactic lawyers, right? Is that right? International fi intergalactic interdimensional fixers. <laughs> if I needed anyone to provide a special gizmo that was out of the normal, for example, Psylocke originally, I thought running around in a very cute costume was great, but the X Men deal with some serious. Um, threats and she was after all blind well, well even though she had artificial eyes at this point thanks to mojo so we gave her a suit of armor produced by landau luckman and lake that always kept that didn't last very long because 
armor works well on Iron Man, but for an X-Men, it was, even though it looked great, it just didn't have the, the panache. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you remember which, um, which Forbidden Planet stores you destroyed and in, in which storylines it was? Scotland, Edinburgh got destroyed when, uh, in Mark Silvestri's run. This, a Colossus was sitting outside sketching and then uh, kids were making fun, you know, were making fun until they actually saw the art and they thought it was cool. And then I think Juggernaut, Juggernaut came to town and Rogue discovered the disadvantage of trying to stop a um, British rail train wearing high heels. <laughs> she was wearing high heels, not the train though. They're probably both applicable. Yeah. And then uh, I think we did London once or twice in Excalibur and uh, X-Men. And then of course there was a, um, a notorious grand tour of North England that was me and Nick Landau and Art Adams and I think uh, John Bolton just driving around and then we, we ran into Excalibur. Well, we ran into Kitty Pride and, and the um, X-Babies. Fantastic. And uh, they swiped some clothes and the car. <laughs> so it would all taken from life. It was a memorable trip. And, and how did you come to start working at Marvel? What was the, uh, what, what it was the, an accident. Yeah. Uh, so I'd love to hear more. Well, the odds of getting a job in, in Washington or even in New York coming from a radical liberal college at the start of the Nixon administration, not too cool. But my parents had a friend, a, a creator named Al Jaffe, who I'm oh, sure you know. Oh, yeah, of course. So I thought I, it would be cool to work for Mad Magazine. So um, I suggested this, and apparently he called my parents and said, there is no way in hell I am suggesting Chris for any kind of job at Mad Magazine. Do you have any idea what we do there? <laughs> which I didn't find out about that for like 25 years, at which point my reaction was, I'd love to find out. <laughs> um, but he said, does Chris have any interest in comics? Because I have a friend, and if he does, I think I could help. So I said, sure, that could be fun. And next thing I know, the phone rings, and the guy on the other end says, hey there, true believer, this is Stan Lee. And I thought, if this is Al's friend, holy cow. So, you know, we have a conversation, and Stan's telling me, well, you know, we're a really poor company. And we're not very sick, you know, we're, we're just hanging on by our thumbs and we don't have the resources to bring, you know, someone in for a couple of months and just, and he, you know, he's basically building up to, sorry, kid, you know, appreciate the thought, but we can't hire you. And I said, well, sir, you have to understand I'm doing this for academic credit. We're not allowed to ask for, for wages. At which point Stan said, you're fired. I hired. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. Yeah. You're hired. And as I keep telling people, it was a philosophy that Marvel has embraced to this day. <laughs> you know, the cheaper you, the cheaper you are, the more guaranteed you are of getting hired. And so I went. You know, that was it. I went into the office, um, which was indeed, I mean, it tiny. You know, there were maybe a dozen people working there. Stan had the only part of the office that had a door. Um, and worked as a dog's body for, for two months, which was yeah. great. Yeah. Must have been fantastic. And, to, you know, to get well, to see Stan up close. Well, Stan didn't come into the office that much. He worked from home. Yeah. Um, the point being that, you know, as he, he would say, I don't have time to to look over everybody's shoulders. I'm I'm too busy keeping the company alive. So Roy Thomas uh, ran the shop, but you've got to realize the bullpen then was John Ramita Sr., Herb Trimpey, Marie Severin, and Frank Giacoya. Yeah. I mean, talk about murderers row. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it's like 
what it, it would be the first four cricketers to come at bat were all hundred plus roundsmen. Yeah, it's an amazing combination of talent that you had there then. Oh no, yeah. it was, the timing was right. And, and so I'm there doing proofreading and the first book I'm given to proofread is uh, Roy, Roy Thomas and Neil Adams X-Men. So it was like, holy cow, right place, right time. And, you know, over the course of those two months, I got to write two or three one-page pieces. You know, Nick Fury, gals I have known and loved, Nazis I have known and killed, things like that. <laughs> but, you know, tanks I have fought at, um, you know, during the war. Who are my, who are my howling commandos, etc. So, you know, you basically do two, two, captions explaining who everybody is you know la contessa valentino allegro de fontana which i still remember after a half century she yeah. was a Christ. you know wow well, she's cute you know yeah <laughs> um but then the the joke was so i'm sitting there reading all the back issues and at the same time doing proofreading and in the middle of this we get an issue of nick fury and i'm proofreading and it's the it is uh, Nick going home to Brooklyn, where you meet his mom and his kid brother, who will grow up to become um, Scorpio. Scorpio. I used to remember that. Except I had just read uh, Sergeant Fury 17, I think, where it's the trial of Nick Fury, where he's on being court-martialed for some something and and the the priest gets up there well you have to understand sir nick fury's had a hard life he's been an orphan since childhood and i'm going huh not this this doesn't this doesn't match so i went into roy's office and i said oh roy's table we have a problem and i told him what it was and he said okay call stan huh call stan huh kid you found it Call Stan. So I call Stan. I said, hey there, true believer. Got you. Can I tell him what's going on? Oh, fix it. Click. <laughs> and I said, well, Roy says, what did he say? Uh, he said, fix it. Who, who do I talk to? Roy said, don't talk to anybody. Just go fix it. Me? Stan told you what to do. Go do it. So I went back to my desk, sat down, looked at the two issues, and after about 10 minutes thought, duh, he goes back to Brooklyn to meet his adopted family and his adopted brother, Scorpio, who will grow up to become one word, boom. And that's, I guess, the first inkling in that world that I might know what I'm doing, because it's... A lot of people think, oh my God, I've got to fix this and I have to rewrite the whole thing. No, you just find that one moment when you, you can just say, ah, that changes everything. And it did for the better. Yeah, of course. And also, you know, I, adds to the mythos of why Scorpio turns out so differently to Fury himself, you know, and yep. it, it really doubles down. It on gets that. everybody off the hook. Yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's fantastic. Yep. Now, now, how long elapsed from that point to before you started? Um, you started on that great early run on Iron Fist that you did with John Byrne. How, oh, how well, that's well. That there's an irony to it. So at the end of you know while we're sitting there, uh, Neil, Roy, and Neil are trying to figure out how to get rid of the Sentinels at the end of that arc in in uh, X Men. So I'm standing there, well, you know, science theorizes that all mutation is, is a result of a nuclear radiation or fusion radiation. And the best source of fusion in our neighborhood is the sun. So I guess you could argue to the Sentinels that you want to get rid of mutants, you got to get, you know, deal, get, deal with the sun. And Neil goes, I can do that. And the next thing he goes, the next thing you have is this full page spread where the sun is too big to fit even in the page with the sentinels zooming down to disappear into, into the solar furnace. So 
and I think I got 25 bucks, maybe. I didn't know, no credit or anything like that, but I, so, but that's it. It's just like, oh, this is easy. So I spent, you know, I went back to school and I just send in, I, you know, pitch, short story pitches to Marvel and they kept ignoring them. And so I got my degree and came to New York to work in acting. And, you, you know, got jobs at Christmas working at, at Saks Fifth Avenue. And then I figured, what the hell? I keep trying to pitch stuff to Marvel. I tried to pitch stuff to DC and Dick Giordano lost it. Really? <laughs> yeah, I sent him like a dozen yeah. story ideas and pitches and he, he mislaid it. Yeah. Which, talk about fate and history, you know, or Len burn them, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know this guy right so I, I went, you know, I started working at Marvel in, I got a job, a temporary job there in, let's see, that would be 73, 74. So I'm in there working two and a half days a week, except that all the stuff I was supposed to, to proofread would always come in on the two and a half days a week I wasn't there. No matter what two and a half days I was there, it was just like kismet. So the thought was, I figured they'd fire me. And Marvel, with its infinite cruelty, figured, ah, we'll, we'll make him full time. That way we'll earn back the money we've already paid him. So I'm doing short stories again. I did a couple of giant sized Draculas with Marv Wolfman. And along the, way, along the way, Iron Fist, which had gone through as many readers as they had issues, it seemed, as many, sorry, as many writers as it ha they had issues, it seemed. And uh, finally, it, it fell into my lap. And I did a couple of more issues in Marvel, not two in one, Presents, not sure. And then the series, uh, we got a good green light to go in its own series, and I got the green light to hire John Byrne, and we were off. But that was, I think, 74, 75, somewhere in there. Yeah, that feels right to me. You know, I, I was reading those comics at the time, and I feel, that feels right to me. Big, big fan, like well, I said, you know. I mean, the most extraordinary thing was just over the course of the 16 issues, watching John just erupt as a visual talent, a storyteller. I mean, yeah. um, you know, the stuff he, the first issue had no, well, it was like looking at the first issue Barry Windsor Smith did of, of um, wasn't Conan. It was Elric, wasn't it? Was it was that Elric? I know, it was something he did for Marvel. It was a really, it was really, really rough. And it was like, oh my God. One of those things you do overnight. Yeah. And there was no hint. Well, there was a vague hint of what was coming, but it was it was extraordinarily challenging to, to pick it out. But then once he hit once he hit with Conan, once he went off and did the side issues with of um, FF or Avengers? Sorry, my brain's yeah. going. I think it was you just every crazy. issue got better and better yeah. and better, and it was just like holy cow. John was very much the same way. Yeah, and and so what, when you guys um, ended up having that like you know your momentous kind of which guys do you mean by you guys? Oh, so I was thinking in terms of. So you meet, so when you got the chance to work on X Men, which is the beginning of this incredibly fortuitous <laughs> relationship for the characters and for you, you and know. I and see that that they're in there. They're in also lies a story because at that point, Len Ween was editor in chief, and I was associate editor. Which you know the way I tell it, which is hopefully true. He's number one. I'm number two. Uh, he had an office with the door. I had the desk outside. So Marvel had decided they want to reboot the X-Men because what happened was back in 68, 69, sales, we were only sold through newsstands, news agents and the like. So the reporting of the sales came in 
seven, eight months after the publication. So we didn't find out until, Marvel didn't find out until September or October of 69, how extraordinarily successful it was starting back in January. Except by then the book had been canceled for four months. Neil had gone back to DC. There was no way we could reboot the, the magic. So uh, it was decided to put the series on hold for a while, have the team guest star with other, with other books and just figure out what to do next. So then in 1974, the, everyone started thinking again, putting every, the pieces together. Uh, Roy was shepherding it. Um, Stan was overseeing from a distance. Um, he tossed some ideas Len's way, which led to Wolverine and ultimately Len. The decision was made, they wanted to try the X-Men, not reboot the original team, but come up with brand new characters, and more importantly, make it an international team. Because Stan's theory was, you know, we're being screwed in the American market, let's see if we can make some inroads overseas. How bad could it be? The beginning of Marvel UK. Ah. And so we, do, we do started with giant size number one. And Lens, the choice for artist was Dave Cockrum, who was then and now one of the most brilliant conceptualists in the business. And he came up with a half dozen extraordinary characters. Uh, Thunderbird, uh, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Storm. The irony being a lot, number of these, Nightcrawler and Storm, had been pitches he'd taken to DC when he was doing Legion of Superheroes that they'd passed on. Yeah. And Storm was actually an amalgam of two different characters, um, which it just came out brilliantly. So they're in Len's office plotting this out, laying this out, because it was intended as a giant sized quarterly, 36 pages of original material and a, re a reprint and reprints that would come out every, every three months because no one wanted to take a gamble. You know, you didn't want to take a shot at a monthly X-Men or a bi-monthly X-Men even and have it blow up in, in one's face. So this seemed like a, a nice way to get to test the water. So the first issue comes out, but while they're plotting it, with everyone, all the X-Men being captured by the, the deadly killer island, Krakoa, they couldn't figure out how to get rid of Krakoa. And so I'm wondering, I keep wandering in and out of Len's office to watch Dave work because Dave was brilliant. And Len kept glaring at me because what, what the hell was I doing in his office when I should be yeah. working? And when it came down to how do we get rid of Krakoa, I had an idea again. So my thought was, you know, he's an island. Well, what's an island? It's the top of a really big mountain. So what do you do? Well, you've got 11, 13 X-Men. Why not just, you know, you've got enough power, guys, slice the island loose from the mountain, push it up into the sky, and let the rotation of the earth on its axis and the revolution of the earth around the sun do the rest because islands generally can't like fly. They can't swim through the atmosphere. All they are is a big chunk of rock. So poor Krakow is sitting up there with no, nothing to hold on to, and the earth keeps moving under his feet, its feet, and with every second he's farther away, both horizontally and vertically. Give him an hour, he's out of the atmosphere. Give him a day and earth is left him behind, and once he gets far enough removed from the gra terrestrial gra gravity well, all the little bits of pieces of rock that are clinging together will separate. And he'll basically be a dust cloud that's, by the time the Earth cir circulates around the sun and comes back next year, it will be so far removed through celestial movement, me being fan fantasy based, it can never pull him, you know, he could never, he, she, it, them can never pull themselves back together again. Little did I realize that 40 plus years later, someone would figure out how to do it. <laughs> 
It, but isn't that the beauty of your your entire sort of relationship with the X Men? Given the fact that you know you turned the X Men into this big, multi-leveled, complex, you know, ongoing melodrama, soap opera, all the various words that have been used to describe it, with such an incredible cast of characters, with all those brilliantly realised female characters that you you wrote, where you were the first guy really to 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 do that, to really explore equality on the comic book page. And uh, I remember there's that great quote from uh, Louise Simonson, where she attributed the X-Men's success entirely to your approach to the characters, saying Chris took them very seriously. They were real people to him. And isn't it the yeah, case why, that... Why, would one, why else would one write them? Yeah. Any character. I mean, the thing... Sorry. I mean, there was a reason why when Len decided he could, he had to give up the book with the first issue with giant size one there's a reason why i tackled him and said i want this book partly it was because i wanted a chance to work with dave cochran especially i mean think about it the x-men is the first superhero marvel certainly superhero concept in the last 50 years that effectively started from scratch I mean, yeah, the concept yeah, X-Men has been around. The, team, the old team was around, but the only thing we had left of the old team was Charlie and Scott and after four issues, Gene. Everything else was brand new. It was, it was unknown country, virgin territory. You can pick whatever cliche one wants. But I could do what I wanted. I could do anything because no one expected it to be successful. No one thought the industry would be successful. So Dave and I figured we might as well have fun because we'd all be fired or out of business or laid off in a matter of years anyway. So what the heck? Um, it's, it was a gift, an opportunity that no one, I think, since, maybe with the exception of Marv doing Dracula, <clears throat> has had. Yeah. I, you know, even, even when you go to Grant's work on new X-Men, it was still grounded in everything that it had come before. Absolutely. Uh, even yeah. when you go to the, the stuff that's happening now with, with World of X, it's all grounded in what came before. Yeah. This was, you know, Len was standing on, Roy was standing on Stan's shoulders, Len was standing on Roy's shoulders, I was standing on, side by side with Len. Yeah. Um, that's an opportunity you, one doesn't get very often. I, I, I can really say that. I think, you, you know, one of one of your the great achievements of your career is, yeah, I think you genuinely did something within within the Marvel Universe that very few people have done. You know, when you look at the success of the X-Men on a broader palette in the movies and in popular culture, you're really looking at the only successful Marvel properties where a lot of the characters were not in fact created by Stan and by Jack. No. Uh, and and no. you know, you're, you're really standing alone there. And also to have such massive influence on that narrative and on the way the movies are put together and indeed upon the success of the movies, you know. I mean, well, the, you don't get that's a whole Fage different discussion. But you don't get Fagy in the Avengers without the X-Men movies and you don't get the X-Men movies without you. Yeah. If only Fox had realized that. <laughs> yeah, right on, if only. These are the people I know. You know, my wife. Um, don't mess with her. It's, so why is every woman in comics back then was a girl? Invisible girl. Ma hey, the Fantastic Four, we have the thing. Giant guy with rocks. We have the Human Torch. What does he do? He sets fire. Reed stretches to an invisible, to incredible lens. Sue. She vanishes. Yeah. Invisible girl. I mean, if that isn't a metaphor. Yeah, right on. You know, I mean, it's it, you. It, it's Saturn girl. It's this girl. It's that girl. The Black Widow is the only non-girl in in the in the catalog, but she was a villain. Yeah, right. She was an yeah, evil yeah. commie spy to start yeah. with. Yes. You know. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. I mean, Doctor Strange's true love, uh, Clea, spent most of the, the issues like, where is Steven? Yeah. You know, Getting or rescued. being captured. 
Yeah. No, everybody, everybody gets captured. Everybody, they are there as a, as a cute aside, always worried about their, their makeup. And ideally the victim that the, the, the guy has to go rescue. I, you know, to me, that was boring. Um, so I, I, I figured if I'm going to have, what, what can the X-Men do that nobody else does? We can have women. And that way it, it, it balances the playing field. It doesn't mean that one is treating the men with disrespect. It just means that it's everyone's on equal terms. I mean, I think, I think what you did was, you know, was undoubtedly way ahead of the curve. And it was something you were, you ha you were to be applauded for doing and have quite rightly been applauded for doing. Um, well, the weird thing is, though, I have no, well, I have no real problem being acclaimed for being ahead of the curve. I think what I find disconcerting is looking at a lot of books these days and not seeing, well, not, not not seeing, I guess what I'm seeing is more of the same cliche. There, there are a lot less, for want of a better term, alpha women as than I would have expected after all this time. It's not as balanced an equation as it should be. I mean, everyone says A is a, a leader, B is a leader, something but looking at the stories i'm not sorry i'm not embracing that or finding it as easy to embrace i mean the personally my, my feeling is that the 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 uh, say the mainstream superhero industry mm -hmm. would really benefit from there being more writers like say gail simone in it you know doing that kind of work and i just don't think you know her kind of approach is replicated enough and i think you know, to really make a difference, you, you need more female creators, you know, and, and, uh, and it still, still feel, feels to me like DC and Marvel is something of a boys club. And, uh, and, you know, you need me, and there's great female talent out there. I just wish they were writing more mainstream, you know, uh, mainstream comics from the big two. The one thing about the X-Men, the one thing about my career, to, to my great, great advantage, was Louise Simonson and Anne Lucenti. They came in because Wheezy came in at the, just the right point when John and I split up. And we were both able to work together to define who the, the series, who the team was, and who the characters were, and move on from there. Uh, and Anne, not being someone who grew up on comics, was able to bring a perception of storytelling and a perception of, well, storytelling in both its figurative and creative sense that moved us apart from what everyone else was used to seeing and expecting to see. Whereas a lot of other editors, regrettably over the decades, have their, their people who, their kids who've grown up reading the stuff. So what they know is what they read. There's not a lot of people coming in with, with outside knowledge, outside expectations, outside ideas. That I mean, the thing that I found most wonderful of working with Wheezy is, I'll sit there going, I have no ideas. And she, we just start talking and then suddenly, boom, boom, boom. You know, it's going in different directions. Well, have you done anything with this character? No, I have. Oh, I have an idea. Because that's how it works. It's just sometimes, at least with me, I just need a poke. Yeah. And I suddenly think, oh, let's try this. It could be interesting. Why not have, you know, the team go to London and blow up a comic book sh store? You know, it's a throwaway. Yes, but it's fun. Yeah. You know, uh, throwing away throwing in throwing away elements from my from my youth well what's this it's who what the weird happenings organization what well it's run by a brigadier why all weird happenings organizations in england are run by a brigadier <laughs> haven't you ever been watching doctor who <laughs> you know and 
nobody over here gets it yeah. or at least until you know the b until b started showing up on cable and and rebooting but it's find a way you know why can't the thing with the x-men was why why does everybody have to be white why does everybody have to be a wasp why can't we come up with with indian heroes or characters uh or why can't we come up with indigenous american indian characters why can't we deal with stuff like racism that they deal with why can't we deal with oppression take the idea of mutants being the ultimate outsiders for me that made that made them unique in the marvel pantheon because everyone else the ff spider-man the avengers all are accidents you know it's like uh hank pym is playing around with something suddenly he's um the uh ant-man Ant -Man. yeah and his girlfriend becomes the wasp um but these are all one-offs. There's, you know, Tony is a guy who builds a suit of armor. Okay. Yeah. The FF go into space. They have an accident. Namor is from Atlantis, but he's also a one-off because he's half human. Um, how very Aquaman of him. Yeah. Or vice versa. Yeah. Um, the X-Men changed the fundamental equation. They're born different. Their mutants make them, their genes make them mutant. Their genes make them different, make them mutants. And that makes them creepy. Why? Because you never know. You could be living a happy, normal life, and then your kid comes out weird, looking like Nightcrawler. How do you deal with that? What do you do? It's like the whole point of God Loves, Man Kills is you have a sergeant, a, a non com in the US Army assigned to to uh, Nevada nuclear tests the whole nine yards his kid comes out weird his wife dies in the process he's totally freaked he turns to the, to to religion he becomes a faith a minister and but at the bedrock is the whole idea that God cursed me or the devil touched me the mutants are evil we have to expunge them it, but I mean, that's the point. It's, it's the clash of, of evolutionary generations and not knowing who, who's going to win. And that, that, in a way, was the whole reason why, for all of my tenure on the book, we kept the number of mutants extremely small. You know, maybe 100. But you look at 100 mutants in the world out of 6 billion people, not a threat. We can deal with it even if one of them is Magneto. Um, after all these decades, uh, uh, that, that huge run on X-Men, when you look back on it, which were, the, which were your favorite artists that you collaborated with? Just real quick. Real quick, pretty much all of them. When you deal Fantastic. with the people with don't play favorites. Yeah. My talk answer when people say, who's your favorite artist? What's your favorite story? The one I haven't worked with yet. The person I haven't worked with yet. The one I haven't written yet. Yeah. Because for me, the future is the unknown country, and I want to see what happens next. I don't, you know, what's already written, what's already drawn, is already out there. That's a question for the audience, not for me. Yeah. And how do you choose? I mean, you know, Barry Windsor Smith versus John Bolton versus John Buscema versus John Romita Jr. versus John Romita Sr. versus, you know, John Buscema. Yeah, the list goes on and on and on. Oh, John Byrne. Of course, there's a lot I hadn't realised until you said all that. There's a lot of Johns in that mix. Amazing how uh, I guess that's a metaphor for life. Or it's a boring name, <laughs> a common name. And do you have a particular storyline that you look back on and you think is a personal favourite of yours? Well, see, everyone says, "What's your favourite X Men?" And I say, "Truth, ninety-four to two seventy-nine, page 11. It's one story for me. It has little bits in it. And that actually, it's one story expanded out sideways through New Mutants and Excalibur and Wolverine because they're all, they're all people to me. So I'm telling their life, life stories from my perspective. 
they have different adventures, but it's all one, it's one common theme, one common environment. It's like saying, um, who's your favorite person at Forbidden Planet? You've known them for all these years. You follow them for all these years. You follow this, the shop or the, the company for all these years. All these different directions, it, it's all interconnected. Spe specifying it down to a moment or a person or whatever. I mean, I could pick one, yes. But then I take a breath and say, but there's also this, and there's this, and there's this for different reasons. Yeah. I mean, if I had to push it down to one story, I would say God Loves Man Kills. But now I have to differentiate because there's God Loves Man Kills as Brent and I did it 38 years ago. But now there's the new edition, which is slightly different because we've added a, we've added a frame to it. Yeah. By me and by me and Brent and and Tom Orzakowski, so it's the original team together again. Yeah. But again, it's it's now a slightly different structure. So people will like it or they won't like it. But as I said, I could say that's my favorite, but then I have to throw in a but. And it's the but that keeps coming up. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I mean, I, I think that's a, I think that's a tremendous answer and, and highly illuminating, actually. Well, the really cheap answer is anything with Alan Davis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he's just a, or wait, no, and John Bolton. Yeah. Well, they are you stellar know. talents, those guys. Uh, and uh, yeah, but they're never available when I need. You know, when I <laughs> you know, John wants to keep doing his own stuff, and Alan, it's like Marvel keeps steering alan and me apart interesting i i, I mean well i have no idea because uh, you know but then he does stuff for dc so who knows yeah yeah One, wonderful stuff and the stuff of course that he created with yourself is unforgettable chris thank you so much for spending this last hour with us uh it's great My to pleasure. chat with you uh thanks for being just a... chatting when i do all the talking and it, you know it's like <laughs> Well, the, silly the thing is, I talk a lot about the X-Men, but nobody wants to sit online who's a Forbidden Planet customer hearing me talk about the X-Men when they can hear <laughs> you talk about the X-Men, I assure you. So uh, I, well, fear you not, should... I will share my opinions with people, just not in this forum. Well, tell, tell all the Forbidden Planet customers that. Keep their eyes peeled for the ne over the next few months because there'll be new stuff coming. And I think hopefully it will be a lot of fun. And next year, assuming stores are allowed to open, it might even be better. Well, you, you've got to come back and visit us. And remember, we're, we're always going to be available here online. Forbidden Planet 42 is going to become Forbidden Planet TV. So when you've got anything, any new releases to come and talk to, about, to us about, please come back and visit us. No worries. I, I will indeed. And it is so lovely to chat with you, mate. Same here. So th this has been Forbidden Planet 42, and you have been watching the legendary Chris Claremont <laughs> discussing his legendary career and his legendary creations. Thank you very much, mate. It's great to see you. You're more than welcome. Take care of Take yourself. Care. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.